and welcome to After Alexander. Echoes of Alexander, Episode 2, A Shadow Over India. In popular imagination, Alexander the Great is associated with India only in the fact that he turned back after his attempt to conquer it. Now, this is something we've discussed in more detail in previous episodes, so I'm not going to go into it here. Instead, I want to explore the impact that Alexander's life, and the successors who came after him, had on the subcontinent that he coveted but could never absorb. Afghanistan and India were supposedly regions where the influence of Hellenization was particularly powerful. In fact, over time, a hybrid culture would develop on the roots of the old Silk Road, which was a mixture of Greek, Iranian and Buddhist influences. This mixed culture is very evident in particularly in the Gandhara, a region where the upper reaches of the Indus, Swat and Kabul rivers converge, from about the 200s BCE right up until the 400 CE. This mixing of cultures would result in Greco-Buddhism, a hybrid culture influenced by both Greek and Buddhist traditions. In fact, some of the statues of the Buddha which were made around about this time seem to have been influenced by old Greek statues of Apollo. Added to that, it is hypothesized that some Greek religious influences were carried over right into Buddhism itself. For example, take the Buddhist concept of a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is an individual who is on their way towards enlightenment or towards Buddhahood. One example would be Quan Yin from the Chinese epic Journey to the West, featuring the Monkey King. Now, it has been noted that this concept bears some resemblance to the heroes of Greek mythology, such as Theseus, Heracles and Achilles, to name but a few. Added to that, some ceremonial practices, such as incense burning, are similar to practices from ancient Greece, which might suggest a direct influence. Equally, it has been noted that some of these practices are also present in Indric traditions, so the jury seems to be out on the exact origins. Bear in mind with all of this, once again, that I'm discussing what I've been able to find about these religions as an outsider, so take my discussion of it with a pinch of salt. Architecture would also be an area of Indian life that would be influenced by Greek styles. For example, the former Nanda capital of Patliputra, which we've touched on before, housed influences from the Ionic Greek style of architecture, while art in the Gandhara region mentioned above would draw from Corinthian styles. And, if we hop back over to religion for a while, a Greek king can even be found in Buddhist religious literature, specifically Menander I, the king of the Indo-Greek kingdom. Now, a bit of a note on our timetable here, seeing as the Indo-Greek kingdom has been mentioned. These Eastern Greek kingdoms are still in the future for us from a narrative perspective, as they don't really come into the narrative picture until roughly the reign of Seleucus II, which is still far in the future for us. However, after we've introduced them, I think we'll probably have to circle back round to their story after independence, right at the end of our narrative and after the fall of the Western Hellenistic Kingdoms. This is because, although it would be interesting to talk about them alongside the other successors, it would just be too much to try and keep track of all at once. As the Greek Eastern Kingdoms will essentially lead a separate life from what's going on in the Mediterranean, after the Parthians roll into town, this is probably the most sensible way of approaching it, with two different narratives one after the other. So, this means that I'm mentioning the Indo-Greek kingdom somewhat out of context now, but rest assured we will get to them in the end. Anyway, Menander I reigned until about 130 BCE, and it is thought that he probably became Buddhist. He definitely became a patron of the religion, and his discussions with a Buddhist wise man called Nagasena were written down in a document called the Melinda Panha, or the Questions of King Melinda. Melinda, by the way, refers to Menander. 
This text is apparently quite an important Buddhist document, and the fact that a Greek king would appear in such a work demonstrates the reach of Hellenistic influence. The work states that Menanda converted to Buddhism and retired, giving his kingdom to his son Strato. However, Plutarch records instead that he died in battle. But we'll get to the reign of Menanda and the Indo-Greek kingdom in time, and when we do, I'll discuss the Melinda Panna in more detail as well. For now, all it's really worth noting at the minute is that Menander I is present in the document, which is a significant Hellenistic influence. Finally, there's cosmology. Traditionally, Indian cosmology had always dictated that the world was a flat disk, with four continents oriented around the central Mount Meru in the manner of flower petals. However, this worldview would over time come to be replaced by the Greek position that the world was instead round. So, here again, you can see Hellenistic influence slowly percolating into Indian culture. So, that's a quick overview of some of the ways the Hellenistic world left its mark on the subcontinent it had once tried to subjugate. There's obviously a lot more we could have talked about, but for the sake of time and the fact that it's only an introduction, we'll have to leave it there. In the meantime, thank you all for listening. For questions or comments, you can get in touch with me at the show's email address. Until next time, have a great week everyone. Thank you.